Greetings, friends. Welcome back to the broadcast. I'm Sean, your host. The website can be found at www.scriptureandprophecy.com. That's where you go to find the archives. That's where you go to support this work. That's where you go to get access to the Biblical Hebrew for Beginners. And uh, much, much more. Well, we are ready for part two of our um, Feast of Purim study. And so if you didn't listen Wednesday, you need to go back and listen to the to part one because I go into detail about what Purim is. And uh, long story short, to, the way we commemorate it or celebrate it is by reading the book of Esther. We read the first four chapters on Wednesday, which dealt with basically the fallout. Esther has become queen. But then uh, the adversary, Haman has come and he's convinced the king or deceived the king rather into uh, putting out there a decree where all the Jewish people are to be executed because he has this great hatred for them and specifically for Mordecai. And Mordecai goes to Esther and says, look, you were brought here and you know, you were born for such a time as this. You need to go to the king and uh, try to get this squared away, try to get this set straight. And if you don't do it, somebody else will. And do not think that you're going to escape what's coming down. And of course, she finally agrees and says, I'm going to do it. And if I die, I die. Such great courage. Try to understand. Esther is queen. Okay? Okay. She lives a life of luxury now and uh, comfort, every, everything she could want at her disposal. And yet, her character is still godly, where she says, I'm, I'm willing to give it all up for my people. I'm willing to, if I, if I die, I die. I'm going to go before the king, present my case. But like I pointed out last or on Wednesday, she doesn't do this willy-nilly. She prays and fasts for three days, makes her staff do the same thing, tells Mordecai for him and the people to do the same thing. There's power in that kind of faith and humility. And what we're going to see here is we begin with chapter 5. We see that courage of Esther as she goes to the king. And then her plan begins to unfold. And then once we get to the end here, we're actually going to see where the Feast of Purim was instituted. We're not just making this up out of thin air. This isn't just something found in the Talmud or something somewhere. Uh, it's in the Bible. And we'll see how that came about. And why we recognize it or acknowledge it now. Not as some religious commandment we have to do, but as a celebration. Something to do because we love the Word of God. And because we are the people of God. That's why we do these things. We know that the feasts were all foreshadows to the Messiah. I'm not ignorant about that. I'm not part of the Hebrew Roots movement who is demanding that everybody celebrate these. We do it because we love God and we want to know more about Him and we want to draw closer to Him. That's why we recognize these things. I feel like I'm going off on a tangent here, but we have people who, on one side, they think it's ridiculous that Christians would observe and acknowledge these things even though they're clearly in the Bible that you possess and hold. So why wouldn't you want to commemorate them and learn more about them? It's just going to draw you even closer to God. It's going to give you a deeper understanding of the, f of the prophecies and the foreshadowings of Messiah. And maybe even a deeper understanding of the very end. But then on the other side, we have those who are acting as though they can observe these the way they were observed in the past. Which for a couple of these require you to go up to Jerusalem and it requires a temple, so that's not really possible. So we have to reason. We have to be within reason. 
And so the way that I approach it, and the way we approach it on these channels when it comes to the feast days is we acknowledge them, we study them, we try to understand them, we commemorate them and celebrate them, but we're not ignorant about about all of it. Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent that's not even really necessary for the podcast. Let's read chapters 5 through 10 and finish our study in the book of Esther, and we'll see, like I said, towards the end, where the Feast of Purim was instituted. Let's begin. King James Bible, Esther chapter 5. Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house, over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in his royal house, over against the gate of the house. And it was so, when the king saw Esther, the queen standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Please note, just to recap, this is the part that Esther was terrified about. Because the law says that unless you're summoned, you're not to go to the court before the king. You can be put to death for that unless he sees you, acknowledges you, and extends the scepter towards you. That means you've been shown favor and grace. Okay? So she gets there. She's been praying and fasting for three days. And he does show her favor and extends the scepter. Okay? Verse 3. Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther? And what is thy request? It shall be given to thee up to half of the kingdom. And Esther answered, If it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto a banquet that I have prepared for him. And the king said, Cause Haman to make haste, that he may do as Esther has said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. And the king said unto Esther at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? Even to half the kingdom it shall be performed. Then answered Esther and said, My petition and my request is, If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my petition, and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them, and I will do tomorrow as the king hath said. Then went Haman forth that day joyfully and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate that stood up, stood not up, nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. All right, so the queen asks for Haman and the king to join her for a banquet. They go to the banquet. He says, what is it that you want? What is your petition? I'm going to grant anything you ask. And she asks, well, would you come back again tomorrow for another banquet. Now it doesn't say why she didn't just unveil what was going on then, um, but something must have been going on in her spirit or something was going on at the banquet that, that indicated that the timing wasn't right, so she put it off for another day. I guess that could be a lesson for us to be listening for the Spirit of God to speak to us and and to tell us when the timing is right instead of trying to rush things. Patience. Anyway, as a result, another day gets to go by or time period goes by and Haman gets to be even more angry and more wrathful because Mordecai still refuses to bow to him. As we, as we just read. Let's continue on. Verse 10. Nevertheless... Haman refrained himself, and when he came home, he sent and called for his friends and Zeresh, his wife. And Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of the children and all the things wherein the king had promoted him and how he had advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. Haman said, Moreover, yea, Esther the queen did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared but myself, and tomorrow I am invited unto her also with the king. Yet, all this availeth me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting in the king's gate. Then said Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends unto him, Let the gallows be made of fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. 
Then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. So as we're going to see, the timing wasn't right because there was one more thing God wanted in place that we'll see. Right now, Haman's saying, you know what? All this amazing thing's happening to me. I've been promoted. I just went to a banquet where the only people invited was the queen, myself, and the king. And I get to do that again tonight or tomorrow night. But as long as that guy Mordecai is still out there, the Jew out there, I'm not going to be satisfied. So his friends and his wife convince him to, ba to make this gallow to hang Mordecai on. Okay? But... If you remember, what we're getting ready to read here in chapter 6, the next chapter, I'm just giving you a little background. What we read la or on, on Wednesday was there was this event where Mordecai overheard this plot by two guys to kill the king, and he, you know, um, exposed that, okay? And we're going to see that come into play now. You see, everything in our lives... We think it's insignificant, but it's not. There's a reason why you are where you are and you're doing what you're doing. God has a plan. And sometimes it's way off in the future that we see the purpose of that thing and we see it unfold. All right, I feel like I'm talking too much. Chapter 6. On that night could not the king sleep, and he commanded to bring the book of records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana, and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains and the keepers of the door, who sought to lay a hand on the king, Ahasuerus. And the king said, What honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servant that ministered unto him, There is nothing done for him. And the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman was coming to the court, ward court, ward court of the king's house to speak unto the king and to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's servants said unto him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, To whom would the king delight to honor more than myself? And Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delighted to honor, let the royal apparel be brought, which the king uses to wear, and the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which is set upon his head, and let this apparel and the horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that they may array the man withal whom the king delighteth to honor, and bring him on the horseback through the street of the city, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor." All right, let's just take a note real quick. Haman's there to discuss with the king about hanging Mordecai on this gallow he just built, had built, right? But when he gets there, he's, the king says, you know what, I need to honor this. There's a person that I need to honor. What is your suggestion on how to do this? And of course, Haman thinks it's about him, and so he thinks what he wants and he says, you know what, king, what you ought to do is have one of your most noble princes uh, take your arraignments and your horse and your crown and put that on this guy and parade him through the city talking about how amazing he is. Verse 10. Then the king said to Haman, Make haste and take the apparel and the horse, and thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew that sitteth at the king's gate. Let nothing fail. Of all that thou hast spoken. So Haman is there to, to discuss the hanging of Mordecai, only to find out that he himself is now going to have to give all these uh, items to Mordecai and parade him through the city. It's amazing. Verse 11 Then took Haman the apparel and the horse, and arrayed Mordecai, and brought him on horseback through the street of the city, and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor. Can we just stop and acknowledge kind of the, the I don't want to say foreshadowing, but I want to say um, just the connection here that we can make about what it means to be a Christian and a child of God 
a true servant of Jesus. And how this speaks, how this story is like a parable. And how it speaks to our future, I believe. The enemy has prepared all these evil things. And what does the scripture say? Everything works out for those who love, for the good of those who love God. What what man means for evil, God means for good. Haman's plotting all this evil, right? It looks bad. It doesn't look good. It doesn't look like this is something that can be turned around, especially not by one person, by one woman, right? By one woman and this guy Mordecai who sits out by the gate. But the world is about to be changed for God's people. And here we have Haman wanting to do this terrible thing to Mordecai, and instead he ends up having to exalt him. Notice that Mordecai doesn't try to exalt himself. No, God exalts him. One of the prayers I've been praying a lot over the last 12 months or so is that those who are in power, who have all these evil intentions, all these evil plans, that they would not get away with everything that they're doing. That instead, like the Proverbs say, that they would fall into their own pits. The ditches that they have dug for us and for God's people, I've been praying that they themselves would fall into it. And that's something that I'm believing in faith, is that, you know what, God's people are going to succeed. And even though it looks bleak, he is in control, and some of these evil things that they have planned for us, may they fall into those plans themselves, into those own snares, into those own traps. Let's finish, let's keep reading, or I'm not going to get through this. Um, all right. Uh, verse 11. Then took Haman the apparel and the horse, and he raided Mordecai, and he brought him on horseback through the street of the city, and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor. And Mordecai came again to the king's gate. But Haman hasted to his house, mourning and having his head covered. And Haman told Zeresh, his wife, and all of his friends everything that had befallen him. Then said his wise men and Zesra, his wife, unto him, If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews before whom thou hast begun to fall, thou shalt not prevail against him, but shalt surely fall before him. So these very people, his wife and his friends who were saying, you know, do this, they find out that Mordecai is a Jew and that things are going poorly for Haman, and they're like, man, it's, it's only going to get worse. <laughs> you know, they know this about God's people. You know, these heathens, they're, even they know, hey, you're going up against one of God's people, one of the Jews, this is going to end badly for you. And while they were yet talking with him, came the king's chamberlains and hasted to bring Haman unto the banquet that Esther had prepared. Chapter 7 So the king and Haman came to the banquet with Esther the queen. And the king said again unto Esther on the second day at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition, queen Esther? And it shall be granted to thee, and what is thy request? And it shall be performed even to half of the kingdom. Then Esther the queen answered and said, I have found, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we are sold, and I and my people to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. But if we had been sold for the bondmen and bondwomen, I held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Then the king Ahasuerus answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he, and where is he that durst presume in his heart to do so? And Esther said, The adversary and the enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. And the king, arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath, went unto the palace garden. And Haman stood up to make request for his life to Esther the queen, for he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. Then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place where the banquet of wine, and Haman was fallen upon the bed wherein Esther was. 
Then said the king, Will he force the queen also before me in the, ha in the house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. And Horbana, one of the chamberlains, said before the king, Behold also the gallows fifty cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. And the king said, Hang him thereon. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. On that day did the king Ahasuerus give the house of Haman, the Jews' enemy, unto Esther the queen. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what, he was, to, what was unto her. And the king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. And Esther spake yet again before the king, and fell down on his feet, and brought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman, the Agite, and his devices that he had devised against the Jews. So one thing to just make sure we take note of is Mordecai is now been given the position that Haman had. He's been given his ring and authority over the house and all those servants and everything that goes along with that work. Haman fell into his own snare, into his own trap, and then God's person, who is humble and righteous, is exalted and moved into that position. I think that's amazing. Verse 4, Then the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king. So now Esther's going before the king the second time because we still have the issue of the law that was written that there's a day coming when all the Jews are to be executed or that the people are allowed to commit violence against them. Verse 5, And said, If it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the things seem right before the king, and I be pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamedatha, the Agite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews which are in all the king's provinces. For now I can endure to see the evil that shall come upon my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? Then the king Ahasuerus said unto Esther the queen, and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and him they have hanged upon the gallows, because he laid his hand upon the Jews. Write ye also for the Jews, as it is liketh to you, in the king's name, and seal it with the king's ring, for the writing which is written in the king's name, and sealed with the king's ring, may no man reverse. So we have a problem here. The problem is that he can't, once he writes something in the law, he can't, like, say, never mind. So you're going to have to come up with a plan and he's given them the authority to write it in his name. So you got to come up with a plan to kind of offset this. Verse 9. Then were the king's scribes called at that time in the third month, that is the month of Sivan, on the three and twelfth day, twentieth day thereof. And it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded unto the Jews, and to the lieutenants, and to the deputies, and rulers and provinces which are in India unto Ethiopia, and a hundred and twenty and seven provinces, unto every province according to the writing thereof, and unto every people after their language, and to the Jews according to their writing, and according to their language. And he wrote in the king Ahasuerus' name, and sealed it with the king's ring, and sent letters by post on horseback, and riders on mules, camels, and young dromedaries. Wherein the king granted the Jews, which were in every city, to gather themselves together, and to stand for their life, and destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish all the power of the people, and provinces that would assault them, both little ones and women, and to take the spoil for prey. So basically, the new uh, decree is going out, saying so that, the, that the Jews have the authority, and it's recommended that they defend themselves. If any decide to go f forward with the with the killings, right, or with the attacks. Verse twelve. Upon one day in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus, namely upon the thirteenth day of the twentieth month of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, the copy of the writing for the commandment to be given every province was published unto all people that the Jews should be ready against that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. 
So the post that rode upon the mules and camels went out, being hastened and pressed on by the king's commandment, and the decree was given to Shushan, the palace. And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white, and with great crown of gold, and with a garment of fine linen and purple, and the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province, in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast, a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for fear of the Jews fell upon them. So not only has God exalted Mordecai, and they've got these decrees going out uh, to balance uh, the plan of Haman, there's now a fear going through the land and you have people actually converting to become Jews because they're afraid of the Jews, right? It says, and many of the people of the land became Jews for the fear the Jews fell upon them. All right, we have uh, basically our last 30 some verses here. Chapter 9 and 10 and then we will be finished. Now, in the twelfth month, that is the month Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's commandment and his decree drew near to put in execution, and the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, though it was turned to the contrary, that the Jews had rule over them that had hated them, the Jews gathered themselves together in their cities throughout all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus, to lay hand on such as sought their hurt. And no man could withstand them, for the fear of them fell upon the people. And the rulers of the provinces and the lieutenants and the deputies and the officers of the king helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house. And his fame went out throughout all the provinces, for this man Mordecai waxed greater and greater. Thus the Jews smote all their enemies, with a stroke of a sword and slaughter and destruction, and did what they did, what they would unto those that hated them. And in Shushan, the palace of the Jews, slew and destroyed five hundred men. And Parshahadatha, Parsh and Daphlon, and Asphatha, and Por Poratha, and Adalia, and Aridiatha, and Parmathshata, and Arasia, and Ardaya, and Vajazatha, the ten sons of Haman, the sons of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, slew they. But on the spoil laid they not their hand. On that day the number of those that were slain in Shushan the palace was brought before the king. And the king said unto Esther, the queen, The Jews have slain and destroyed five hundred men in Shushan the palace, and the ten sons of Haman that have they done in the rest of the king's provinces. Now what is thy petition, and shall it be granted thee, or what is thy request further, and it shall be done? Then said Esther, If it pleases the king, let it be granted to the Jews which are in Shushan to do tomorrow also according to this day's decree, and let Haman's ten sons be hanged upon the gallows. And the king commanded it to be done, and the decree was given at Shushan, and they hanged Haman's ten sons. For the Jews that were in Shushan gathered themselves together on the fourteenth day also of the month, Adar, and slew three hundred men of Shushan. But on the prey they laid not their hand. But the other Jews that were in the king's provinces gathered themselves together and stood for their lives and had rest from their enemies and slew of their foes seventy and five thousand. But they laid not their hands on the prey. On the thirteenth day of the month, Adar, and on the fourteenth day of the same, rested day, and made it a day of fasting and gladness. But the Jews that were in Shushan assembled together on the thirteenth day thereof, and on the fourteenth thereof, and on the fifteenth day of the same they rested, and made it a day of fasting and gladness. Therefore the Jews of the villages that dwelt in the unwalled towns made the fourteenth day of the month, Adar, a day of gladness and fasting, and a good day of sending portions to one another. And now we're going to see the basically the Feast of Purim instituted, starting with verse 20. And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters unto the, all the Jews that were in the, all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus, both nigh and far, 
to establish this among them, that they should keep the 14th day of the month of Adur and the 15th day of the same yearly. As the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies, and the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy, and from mourning into a good day, that they should make them days of feasting and joy, and of sending portions one to another, and gifts to the poor. And the Jews undertook to do as they had begun, and Mordecai had written unto them. Because Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agite, the enemy of all the Jews, had devised against the Jews to destroy them, and had cast pure, that is, the lot, to consume them, and to destroy them. But when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letters that his wicked device, which he devised against the Jews, should be turned upon his own head, and that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows wherewith they called these days Purim, after the name of Pur. Therefore all the words of this letter, and of that which they had been concerning this matter, and which had come unto them. The Jews ordained and took upon them, and upon their seed, and upon all such as joined themselves unto them, so as it should not fail, that they would keep those two days according to their writing, and according to their appointed time every year. And that is these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city that these days of Purim should not fail from among the Jews, nor the memorial of them perish from their seed. All right, so you just had like 10 verses there describing Purim, how it was instituted then, and then it goes on to say that this should be celebrated by every generation. Let's continue on. Verse 29. Then Esther the queen, the daughter of Abilahel, and Mordecai the Jew, wrote with all authority to confirm this second letter of Purim. And he sent the letters unto all the Jews, to the hundred and twenty and seven provinces of the king Ahasuerus, with words of peace and truth, to confirm these days of Purim and their times appointed according to as Mordecai the Jew and Esther the queen had enjoined them. And as they had decreed for themselves, for their seed, the matters of the fastings and their cry. And the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim, and it was written in the book. And the king Ahasuerus laid tribute upon the land and upon the isles of the sea, and all the acts of his power and of his might. And at the declaration of the greatness of Mordecai, whereunto the king advanced him, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was next unto the king Ahasuerus, and great among the Jews, and accepted the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people, and speaking peace unto all his seed. And that, my friends, is the end of our study in the book of Esther. I pray that you've been blessed this morning. And you might wonder, why would they want to read this year over year? Well, it's a reminder of what God is able to do, especially when his people humble themselves and they fast and they pray and they seek his face. Even in the face of the impossible circumstances, God can turn it around and exalt his people. We need that reminder on a, re on a yearly basis. We need to remind ourselves of that reality, especially in the times that we're living in now. Well, thanks for listening, friends. I pray you've been blessed by this podcast, and I thank you for listening. I thank you for those of you who are willing to support it, to help it make it possible. I'm very, very grateful. Peace and grace be to all of you. And until next time, God bless.